Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. I think that's a question for consumers. What's in store for the state's medical marijuana? You can't, can't win the championship every year. You gotta, you know, it's okay to finish second place. Louisiana farmers get ready for harvest. Louisiana has been serving as one of Hollywood's favorite leading ladies uh, for well over a century now. Promoting famous film locations. This is the first institution that I've been at that did not practice a holistic review of applications. A change that's being challenged. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a check on some of the top headlines. Louisiana is one of 20 states listed as plaintiffs in the latest push to scrap the Affordable Care Act once and for all. A judge's ruling could bring the law that gives 20 million Americans health insurance to a halt. At issue are core principles of the law, including protections for people with pre-existing medical conditions and limits on how much older customers can be charged. Republicans say that when Congress eliminated the penalty for not having health insurance as part of last year's tax bill, lawmakers rendered the entire health law unconstitutional. Democrats do not agree. A new study is finding a tragic link between bullying and attempted suicide and says Louisiana is ground zero. The Wallet Hub survey found our state has the nation's worst problem with bullying, leading to the highest attempted suicide rate in the country. The survey found Louisiana has the highest percentage of high school students who have attempted suicide and the highest percentage of high school students bullied online. Congressman Ralph Abraham from Richland Parish is working on a new farm bill and is pushing for major reforms for food stamp eligibility. Abraham supports a worker school requirement for someone able-bodied to be eligible for SNAP. He says employers are desperate for labor and this is a good step towards moving the unemployed into the workforce. More than 150 soldiers with the Louisiana National Guard are back home after a nine-month deployment in Kuwait, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The Marksville-based unit returned September 1st after working in support of Operations Spartan Shield, Freedom's Sentinel, and Inherent Resolve. While deployed, officials say the unit completed 35 projects exceeding $15 million in construction costs. LSU Today, all smiles announcing that record freshman class. There's some controversy, though, about an LSU decision that came to light this past weekend. It's over a new admissions policy at Tigertown. After nearly 30 years of rejecting applicants whose ACT scores failed to meet the minimum, LSU is adjusting its enrollment standards and embracing holistic admissions. The holistic philosophy gives greater weight to personal recommendations, student-written essays, and outside activities. LSU Board of Supervisor Chairman Stephen Perry tells me, holistic means LSU has every tool to evaluate a student's potential, not based solely on a test score. He says the school will offer more flexibility to applicants and overall standards won't change. LSU Vice President Jose Avilas will oversee the change and says it is long overdue. You know, I've been in this business of college admissions for the last 20 years. Um, I would say that this was by far um, the most archaic practices of, of admissions that I had seen. Not everyone agrees. Successful Baton Rouge businessman Richard Lipsy tells me he is concerned and points the finger at LSU President F. King Alexander. 
He questions why make such a change when LSU's freshman ACT scores are at an all-time high and their stability after years of financial cuts to LSU. Lipsy is a longtime member of the State Board of Regents, but says he only first heard of the major policy change in the newspaper. He says, quote, I hate to see King Alexander tear all that down, emphasizing that this is strictly his personal opinion and not a statement of the board. There's been a war of words between Lipsy and Alexander this week, with the latest entry, an opinion letter penned by Lipsy in this week's Advocate newspaper. It's headlined, Don't Lower LSU Standards. Does it surprise you that there's been some backlash from some of the education and community leaders who are thinking this is not a good thing? Yeah, frankly, it, it is surprising because, again, holistic review is not new. And when you look at the top 50 institutions, according to U.S. News and World Report, the top 50 public, all but two of those institutions practice holistic review in admissions. Among the flagships, there's only there's 50 flagships in the country, right? These are some of the oldest and most prestigious institutions in the world. LSU's in that class of institution. There's about seven or eight institutions that do not practice holistic review. State Representative Pat Smith is a lifelong education advocate and believes the change will be one of growth for LSU. We are a very diverse state and I think that when we start looking at policies and procedures no matter at what level they are we should be looking at the diversity that we have in the state and higher ed is just one example of that and this policy that LSU is putting in is indeed not going to diminish the fact that they bring in the best, best and the brightest students. And another note about that record freshman class, it also features more out-of-state students than ever before. The end of the summer is a busy time for Louisiana farmers. Corn, soybeans, rice, and cotton are in various stages of harvest. LPB's Kelly Spires has more on the state's multi-billion dollar ag industry. Andre, that's right. After worrying all season about weather and market prices, some farmers in the northwest part of the state are facing what seems like another insurmountable hurdle, shipping logistics. It's just really the biggest problem we have every day during harvest season is figuring out, you know, lining up trucks and, and where they're at and where they're going and, you know, how much they weigh. Harvest season is a hectic time on Kyle Dill's farm outside of Shreveport where he grows soybean and corn. Geographically, Dill is in a tough part of the state. He's 60 miles from his corn buyer and 120 miles from a grain elevator for his soybeans. Just for example, our corn harvest it, on a normal year, it would take seven trucks behind one combine, and we would try to get those trucks three loads a piece a day. So, um, you know, that's and that's just everything going right. We have to space them out where you know they're they're all here in the morning when we get started, and we just slowly file them out. Agriculture Commissioner Mike Strain says it's a problem a lot of farmers in that part of the state have. The further you are from a grain elevator, the more time it takes and the more it costs you to move your product. Corn, Strain says, is of use to the poultry industry, so farmers can sell it to inland facilities. There is no soybean crushing facility in the state, so soybeans largely go to a facility on a river for export. On the Red River, there's not one north of Alexandria. Dredging is a huge, huge issue. We need to dredge the Red, we need to dredge the Mississippi River and keep that open. On Dill's farm, the transportation coordination has stalled, so his combines are sitting still and his corn is waiting in the field in a window of perfect weather. And the weather hasn't done Dill's corn crop any favors this year. We started off with a really, really wet spring. Um, we were sitting on the turn row every day just trying to like, you know, is it dry enough, is it dry enough, is it dry enough? And we finally started planting. It was dry enough for the tractor to go across, but probably not ideal conditions to plant into. In April, we got a few rains at the beginning of the month, and then by the middle of the month to end of June, there was just, I mean, no rain hardly. You know, we were expecting low, low yields, but they ended up being lower than we thought. Bad luck with rain is not the case everywhere in Louisiana, Strain says. We've had pretty good weather. I mean, really, we've been spared. We haven't had any major storms. You know, the storms that 
literally knock the plants down or what we call lodge them, lodge them down in the ground. And if folks irrigate their crops, Strain says those bushel per acre yields are really looking up. 200 bushel corn, 100 bushel beans, really, really nice. And our cotton, no bale and a half cotton. So we're very fortunate. What we have in Louisiana is some great advantages. One, with our temperature, we get crops in the ground generally a few weeks ahead of the rest of the country. So ours is ready to go to market first. Secondly, we have some wonderful, beautiful soil here, some of the richest alluvial soil anywhere in the world, and we have water. You know, we have water from our rivers, we have waters from our bayous, we have water underneath the land, so we have significant access to water, whether you, you, you pump it or whether or not you can, you know, you, you get it from a well. The price farmers can get for soy and corn, now that is something to worry about, Strain says. If you look at corn, 360, 370, 380 is break even, and we're trading at 343, we're trading at 870, Midwest at seven. And so it's a, it's, it, things are, are very tight, so we, hopefully we recover our, what we call our variable cost, our planting cost, but not the long-term fixed cost, buildings, land, et cetera, interest rates. Strain says the key to bringing prices back up is another giant force outside of farmer's control, international politics. We're really looking to try to get these trade deals you know, resolved, and if you look what's going, Mexico has now said we're gonna sign a deal. Canada has just finished, you know, multiple days of intense negotiations. We're getting close and we think hopefully within the next week or two, we can go ahead and have an agreement with Canada. Now China's gonna be a little more difficult, but the European Union has agreed to buy more beans and other products for us. But that's why the trade promotion activities are so critical that we can open the new markets while we're trying to reestablish the current market so we can have fair and free trade. A lot of farmers enter contracts to sell their products months in advance. A lot of this year's crops, they were sold months ago. You know, normally a farmer, some farmers, I've looked at some balance sheets today where the farmer sold almost nine, 10 months before delivery, they go ahead and book their crops. But normally most farmers sell about half of the crop right around planting, another half, another half of what remains right about midway through and then very close to harvest they will sell the others so they'll stage it because they have to deliver what they've sold. Dill says he's looking forward to next year and is thankful that years in the past have been good. When we run into challenges you kind of have to see that through as well because this year we're having a horrible corn crop but last year was our best corn crop we've ever had and you just kind of have to look at the balance of it. Um, you can't can't win the championship every year you gotta you know Okay, finish second place. Sugarcane processing will also start this month. Again, with this crop, experts are expecting lower yields than last year. Strain says that they are watching an influx of sugar from Mexico, too. All right, Kelly, thanks so much. The medical marijuana programs here and in many other states operate outside the scope of federal agencies that regulate pharmaceuticals. But what about the role of insurance companies as these new meds are dispensed? Kelly Spires talked with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana economist Michael Berto to sort things out. To get started, Mike, I'd like to ask you kind of for you to outline the basics of the state's medical marijuana program for me. Well, as I understand it, um, the legislature just approved and added to a pretty significant list of conditions for which you can qualify for a recommendation for medical marijuana. Doctors can um, apply to the State Board of Pharmacy and be approved to make recommendations for certain conditions of medical marijuana. There'll be 10 uh, pharmacies scattered around the state who have licenses to distribute the medicinal product Typically in the form of an oil, like CBD oil, um, there's no provision for allowing anything that's smokable to be legal. Um, and then those opportunities for the doctors to offer a recommendation, that recommendation will allow you to purchase um, the cannabinoid oil when you go to one of the 10 pharmacies scattered around the state. Right, limited number of doctors, limited number of patients per doctor, and yes. limited number of places where you can actually go to get this product. Right. When you think about you know, the medical economy, insurance, of course, plays a huge role in that. Sure. How 
does Blue Cross Blue Shield deal with medical marijuana in states where this is established already? Well, in general, um, until very recently, as recently as a month ago, the FDA has never approved a drug uh, that was a substitute for medical marijuana. And we don't typically cover any drugs that are not FDA approved. And we typically don't pay for drugs that are over-the-counter drugs. So if a doctor can't prescribe it, the odds are pretty good that an insurance company won't pay for it. We're very concerned about things like purity and safety and the um, most of the medical marijuana products haven't reached that threshold yet. Maybe we should take a step back. Can you explain to me how the FDA and the DEA interact with medical marijuana? Well, normally when a drug gets approved, it goes through a very detailed and lengthy process at the FDA. Um, they do research, they do trials, clinical trials, ultimately human trials. And then once the FDA is comfortable that the drug is efficacious, it's safe, and it has the effect it's supposed to without too many side effects, the drug gets approved. And then after that, if it's a Schedule One or a controlled substance that the Drug Enforcement Administration cares about, then they'll issue guidelines on how it is prescribed. Um, you may have run into a situation where some drugs you get from your doc, you get a prescription, it's on paper, you have to carry it to the pharmacy, you get it filled once and then it's over. And other drugs, the nurse can call in and you get a 90 day refill and it goes on forever. All of that's kind of determined by the way the DEA sees the compounds. Can you tell me more about um, what happened over the summer? Where in the process of m maybe getting an FDA approved? Yeah, yeah a, a British drug company was able to put um, marijuana compounds, a version of very purified version of CD, CBD oil through the normal FDA processes and the FDA signed off on the drug. And now it's at the DEA and they're going to determine how it will be prescribed. And I wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, CBD oil go through normal channels and be available um, in drugstores within the next six to eight months. Wow. Yeah. So is there a chance that the FDA approved product mm -hmm. will outpace the medical marijuana economy that we're seeing come up here? I think that's a question for consumers. Um, if you have the opportunity to purchase a drug at your normal drugstore with a normal prescription from your normal doctor, and it's been, you know, the FDA has overwatch over right, that right. product yeah, versus buying it with a recommendation from a, pres from a prescriber, so something that's locally grown and produced, where you don't have the FDA oversight on purity and that sort of stuff, you, you, the consumer has to choose. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if consumers preferred the established process versus the new one. What are you hearing from Blue Cross Blue Shield consumers? We've had inquiries about people whether we would cover medical marijuana um, under our insurance plans. Today, that's not possible. Um, it's not FDA approved, number one. Number two, the um, dispensaries are essentially cash businesses in every state. And so we're not really set up to pay cash for stuff. Um, usually, um, there's no way to process that. I also have concerns I get uh, to see the reports from the regulators in other states on when they do visits to dispensaries, when they secret shop dispensaries, and some of the uh, samples that they're taking have uh, shown evidence of um, pesticides and fungus and mold and bacteria, listeria, and they've, they've got people working in the dispensaries in some of the recreational states who make medical recommendations to their patients. Things like recommending weed to women who are pregnant, which the American Society for Pediatrics has said, no, 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 you can't do that. So it's still kind of the wild, wild west. And so I do have some concerns about how that'll evolve. To its credit, the legislators in Louisiana have been very strict about how they want to dispense medical marijuana. This whole system where docs have to be cleared with the pharmacy board, where they only issue 10 licenses, that makes it easy to police, right? If you only have to police 10 locations, I think that if they're going to go down this road, they're going about it the right way. And um, there are so many people who believe that these products are helping them that I actually do believe within the next few years, you'll see several different drugs in the normal pipeline based on marijuana that will have a positive impact on people's health. Um, but jumping the gun on that sometimes can have a cost. And I just want to make sure people are advised of the, the sort of consumer protections they have today. 
All right, well, thank you for filling us in and sure. giving us your time. Thank you. Absolutely. And you can find out more on this topic and others on the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana blog. It's straighttalkla.com. You know, it's just in the past decade or so that Louisiana earned the reputation as Hollywood South, the result of a boom in movie and TV production that happened after the state courted Hollywood with that lucrative tax incentive plan. The pitch worked, the industry grew, and now at your fingertips, a way to visit the places where all of those films were made. Leanne Weil from the Louisiana Office of Tourism. The state is now taking a next step with the movie making process. It's a natural to allow visitors to see where some of these films were made. Lights, camera, Louisiana. Lights, camera, Louisiana. You're right, Andre. Um, Louisiana has been serving as one of Hollywood's favorite leading ladies uh, for well over a century now. We kind of forget how far back our history goes um, because it's gotten so much more attention in recent years with the film tax credit laws uh, has renewed the industry, but Hollywood has literally been coming here for well over a century, and Louisiana has served as uh, one of Hollywood's favorite stars. And there are all these locations where so many films, I think 2,500 is a, a total, have been made. So an opportunity for people, visitors, tourists, to come and see where some of these were made. Uh, for example, Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, Betty Davis, you can go to the plantation and they'll show you the bedroom where uh, she slept. They will show you the bedroom where she slept. That, of course, is in Homa's house. Uh, they have that site very well documented and that's what we're looking for for, you're exactly right, there have been over 2,500 films uh, shot in Louisiana. We are starting our project with about 20 or 25 and we will continually be adding on to it as more and more films are made. Just as another example, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of Tarzan, Lord of the Louisiana Jungle, yes. being shot in Morgan City. That was shot in 1918. And interestingly, it was only the fifth or sixth movie, 100 years ago, to ever gross a yeah. million dollars. Which was a big, big deal. And now, if you don't gross a million dollars in the first, what, 48 hours, <laughs> you're a failure. But in 1918, that really put Louisiana on the map. What do people need to know? Where do they need to go, though, uh, if they want to begin seeing some of these sites on this movie trail. Perfect. Uh, well, we invite all visitors, whether you're a Louisianian who wants to explore your state a little more or you're from someone from outside of the state or even in another country, we invite everybody to always start with louisianatravel.com. And when you get to louisianatravel.com, you can just do a search for movies if that's your interest, and it will take you to our microsite. Uh, there you will see, again, and keep checking back, because this is a site that's gonna grow and grow and grow and grow. It's gonna be an evolving thing. It's gonna be ever evolving. We have a map uh, on there. We have uh, individual tiles for about 20, 25 different movies. You can click on those tiles. It'll tell you where you can go. It will describe a little something about that movie that maybe you didn't know about. And it will give you, uh, importantly for us in tourism, it lets you know when, uh, what days and hours they are ready to accept you to come by and learn more about uh, the movie that was shot there. The basic information that someone making plans to go do something or to travel, to, to visit, would need to know those basic things. Well, Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser has really made it uh, his charge to push forward and promote Louisiana to the hilt. One question here. Yeah. What is, what's your first stop on the movie trail? What would you go to first? Well, I have been to several of these. One I recently went to though, cause I did not know that John Wayne had shot um, a, uh, a film here and uh, he did. Uh, and it was, it's a, it was a Western, of course, and he filmed it up in the Natchitoches area. So there's a historic site up there that um, 
I just wanted to go. I wanted. I wanted. I get it now. I wanted my little pumps to, to <laughs> follow in those cowboy boots that John Wayne stepped in. So, right, so that's your uh, first stop. That was my first stop. But there's mine, mine would be at Homeless House with um, I think with Hush Hush, Hush, Hush Sweet, Sweet Charlotte. Charlotte. As a kid, that's a movie that scared me, but I loved it, and uh, the history of it is very fascinating. So that would be my first stop. But we could spend our lifetime visiting all these places. We can, and we have uh, a lot more that we're going to be um, adding on. The one I've got my eye on, which we're gonna be adding pretty shortly, is gonna be Tom Hanks, just recently disembarked from the state uh, where he was aboard the USS Kidd mm -hmm. filming uh, a movie called Greyhound, right. a World War II movie. And of course, Louisiana has such a history when it comes to World War II. We have the beautiful museum, we have the USS Kidd. Andrew Higgins built the boat that yes. Eisenhower said won the war right here in Louisiana. So um, I'm looking forward to putting Greyhound on that and getting some visitors down on that beautiful uh, riverfront here in Baton Rouge. All right, when does that movie come out? Do we know the release? I don't know All that right. yet, or if I did, I'd have to kill you if I told <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, Leanne, thank you so much. Thank you, so thank you, Andre. Thanks. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download's free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching us. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.